Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Burns, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online event. Uh, yes, we are a webinar. You can call us that. We won't be offended. <laughs> um, that uh, We host this um, webinar um, every Wednesday live at 10 a.m. Central Time, uh, but it is recorded, so if you're unable to join us on Wednesday mornings, that's fine. All of our sessions all the we've had going back to the beginning, our first one was in January 2009, um, are, all the recordings are available on our website, so you can always go back and watch them at any time you want to later. Um, we do anything that may be of interest to librarians or libraries. Um, we do presentations, interviews, mini training sessions, um, whatever we can um, what's out there that we think would be of interest and want to share, um, we'll put, we'll have it on the show. Um, we have commission staff, Nebraska Library Commission staff do presentations sometimes. We also bring in guest speakers, um, which I really like to do, um, bring in people who um, maybe wouldn't be able to come here to Nebraska to travel and present to us or to travel around the country, but can get and them on the show, and that's what I've done. That we've got this morning. Um, Jamie Hollier is on the line. Hi, Jamie. Hi there. Say hello. <laughs> she is um, involved in multiple projects, actually. Uh, <laughs> um, this morning, though, she's going to talk to us about the Digital Public Library of America, that particular um, new resource that um, has just gone live um, earlier, a few months ago. Yeah, well, live in April. In April, yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, she's going to uh, tell us all about what's up with that, what it's all about, and um, how libraries and can get involved in it. So go ahead and take it away, Jamie. Great. Thanks so much. Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. It's re I'm really excited to be here and talking with you guys today. Um, some of you may know me. I feel like I uh, recognized a couple names uh, in the attendee list, but I am... Uh, kind of a library consultant. Um, I'm a project management consultant. I do a lot of work with libraries, nonprofits, and other um, organizations. Um, and I'm also a board member for the uh, Board of Directors for the Digital Public Library of America. Um, now bear with me, I'm the new board member. <laughs> so when the official launch of um, the Digital Public Library took place in April um, is when I came on as a board member. So I have only been with the organization for a few months. Um, and I will be able to answer most of your questions, but maybe not all of them. So if there's anything that we get to and you have a question and I can't answer right away, I will be sure and get that information to you later on. So um, let's go ahead and get started. I don't know how many of you know about the Digital Public Library of America already, um, but it's the mission is to bring together the riches of America's libraries, archives, and museums, and to make them freely available to the world. Um, we achieve this mission through three main elements. The first is that we are a portal for discovery, and we deliver students, teachers, scholars, and the public access to resources from across the nation. Additionally, we are a platform that enables new and transformative uses for our digitized cultural heritage. And lastly, we are an advocate for a strong public option in the 21st century. Now we'll talk a little bit more about each of these elements and then we'll go in and do a little um, site tour and we'll look at the site itself. So first off, the portal. Um, the per portal serves as a point of access to over 2.5 million items. So photographs, manuscripts, books, sounds, uh, video, moving images, more. And from, those are all from libraries, archives, and museums across the nation. Users can browse and search the collection by timeline using the map tool, format, topic, and they can also save those items to customize lists and share those lists with others. So users can also explore digital exhibits created by the DPLA's content providers, partners, and staff. The objects in the DPLA cover hundreds of years of our cultural heritage. So you can browse it by century, decade, and even year using our innovative timeline tool, which is a really interesting and fun way to engage with the collection. You can also browse by place. So if you're curious to see what resources the DPLA has from your home state or from your college town or from the city where your parents were born, there are hundreds of thousands of objects in our database that can be viewed using the map interface. The DPLA and its partners have curated a series of virtual exhibits highlighting specific themes such as activism in the United States, 
Prohibition and a joint exhibit with the organization Europe, uh, Europana. And that's a European digital library, and they tell the story of European immigration to the United States during the 19th and 20th, 20th centuries through their online exhibit. These exhibits include full photographs and detailed information about specific topics. And we've had a few exhibits up for a while. We're working on some new ones, so that's going to be changing in the near future as well. You can also sign up with the site and register for a DPLA account that will allow you to create lists and save items and searches for your reference. At the end of the slides, we'll actually get on the site and take a look around, so you'll see all the features I just uh, mentioned very quickly. We'll look at them in a little more depth later. So where does the content come from? The DPLA, um, the DPLA Digital Hubs pilot program is uh, the program that was created to design a national network out of over 40 state and regional digital libraries and a collection of large digital libraries in the United States. The DPLA partners with these state and regional aggregators and large li digital libraries to bring together content from across the nation. Note that the DPLA aggregates the metadata records, the information that describes the item, um, but not the content itself. So each record in the DPLA links to the original object on the content provider's website. So we have all the records, but once someone actually wants to view the item, we link people out and send people out to the, the providers. And we can look at that later also, with the site tour. So um, what's the difference between service and content hubs? Well, content hubs are large digital libraries, museums, and archives that maintain a one-to-one -one relationship with the DPLA. So those are the ones we work with um, directly that have the collection. So content hubs, as a general rule, provide more than 250,000 unique metadata records, and they resolve digital objects such as online text, photographs, manuscript material, artwork, etc. That's um, to the DPLA. And they are committed to maintaining and editing those records as needed. As of July, um, as of this month, the content hubs include the following institutions. Art Store, the Biodiversity Heritage Library, the David Rumsey Map Collection, the Harvard Library, the Haiti Trust Digital Library, the National Archives and Records Administration, the New York Public Library, the Smithsonian Institute, the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, and the University of Virginia. But that's not all. <laughs> we also have service hubs. So the DPLA service hubs are state or regional digital libraries that aggregate information about digital objects from libraries, archives, museums, and other cultural heritage institutions within its state or its region. So each service hub offers its state or regional partners a full menu of standardized digital services, including digitization, um, metadata assistance and training, data aggregation, storage services, as well as locally hosted community outreach programs. So bringing users in contact with the digital content for, of local relevance. And as of July 2013, the service hubs have, some of, the, some of the included service hubs are the Digital Commonwealth from Massachusetts, the Digital Library of Georgia, the Kentucky Digi Digital Library, the Minnesota Digital Library, Mountain West Digital Library, which includes like Utah, Nevada, Southern Idaho, and Arizona, and South Carolina Digital Library. Now we are constantly working to add more content and service hubs, so those two lists I just gave you are going to be growing and um, more content will be added all the time because that's something we're very um, focused on for, these, for this work right, that we're doing right now. So to help visualize the relationship between all of these different pieces, um, of the service hub relationship, um, imagine it like this. So your local historical society or public library is, kind of, is a pond, and it contains its unique, valuable cultural content, um, often very local um, content. So those ponds send their content through tributaries to the lakes, which are the DPLA service hubs. And those are the, aggregated, the places that aggregate data from the various cultural heritage institutions and their state or their region. So those are basically the, um, the ponds, which is the small library going up to the state or, or region organization, which is the lake, and then the service hubs um, feed this content through the rivers into 
what we call the ocean, which is the Digital Public Library of America. So we take all of this content and the smaller to the bigger to the bigger, so we have that national view. In addition to serving as a content portal for students, teachers, scholars, and the public, the DPLA is also a powerful platform that enables new and transformative uses of our digitized cultural heritage. With an application programming interface, which is an API, and I don't know if you guys are familiar with that. If you're not, I can go into that in more detail. Just let me know. Um, so with, a, with an API and a maximally open data, the DPLA can be used by software developers, researchers, and others to create environments for learning, tools for discovery, engaging apps, all sorts of things. And we have some examples of some apps that have already been made using our um, API and our open data, and it's really interesting. Um, so I'll give you guys a look at that in a little bit as well. So with the API, you have access to millions of items. Um, Developers can, um, through the powerful API, developers from all walks of life can build these tools, widgets, plugins, and all kinds of things. The DPLA app library contains a handful of those applications built by independent developers interested in seeing what open cultural heritage data can look like in new and interesting contexts. We've also done some hackathons for DPLA, um, and also um, earlier this year during the National Day of Civic Hacking, um, DPLA put a challenge out there that um, developers use our API to create some new tools and resources on that National Day of Civic Hacking. So we, we've gotten really involved with the, the tech community and, and the developers to make sure that these resources are being leveraged and used in new and creative ways. Here are a couple examples of a couple APIs. Um, OpenPix, for instance, is an open source uh, iPhone application for viewing images from remote sources, including the DPLA. You can download it right now on the Apple Store if you wanted to take a look. It's a really cool tool. Um, Cultural Collage is another one, another tool that uh, lets you search the DPLA's image archives and view results in a stream of images. You just keep scrolling to fetch more, and clicking on an image saves it to a scrapbook without losing your position in the screen. So it's really, uh, for those of us that are visual, like me, <laughs> it's a really amazing tool. Um, and if you want a local copy of all of the DPLA's data, you can get that. Um, all of our data in the repository provided through that API is available for download. And these include the standard DPLA fields, as well as the complete record received from the partner. Additionally, all the data brought into the DPLA from its partners is normalized to the DPLA metadata application profile and enriched with information such as geospatial data. GeoNames, for instance, is a geographical database containing millions of unique geographical names corresponding to places on the globe. And through those enrichments like this that the DPLA is using, we're making cultural heritage data more useful and relevant by making it found in unique ways. So that third piece I talked about earlier is in the very beginning um, was a public option. So for most of American history, the ability to access materials for free through public libraries has been a central part of our culture, producing generations of avid readers and a knowledgeable, engaged citizenry. And you guys all know this. You work in libraries. Um, the DPLA works along with like-minded organizations and individuals such as you to ensure that this critical open intellectual landscape remains vibrant and broad in the face of increasingly restrictive digital options. The DPLA seeks to multiply openly accessible materials to strengthen the public option that libraries represent in their communities. And we want to op operate fully within copyright law. However, the DPLA thinks there are alternate models out there that can creatively expand our access to important cultural materials. With institutions like Creative Commons, Ungluit, History Harvest, and others, the DPLA advocates for broad and deep open access ecology. Creative Commons, for example, the nonprofit that enables the sharing and use of creativity and knowledge through free legal tools, their free, easy-to-use copyright licenses provide a simple, standardized way to give the public permission to share and use a creative work on conditions of your choice. I don't know how many of you guys know about Ungluit, but it's really cool. It can be thought of as a Kickstarter for books. Through this model, publishers or authors post their books and provide a dollar figure at which they'll 
release an open access ebook copy. And so people contribute money to it, and then once enough money is contributed, the book is unglued and it becomes a free open access ebook. And then History Har um, Harvest from the University of Nebraska and Lincoln. Um, at each harvest, community members are invited to bring and share their letters, photographs, objects, and stories, and then participate in a conversation about the significance and meaning of their materials. And each artifact is captured by those college students and then allow, allowed to be open and available to everyone. So these are some ways um, that we're working with other organizations and are interested in what's happening, and DPLA is interested in becoming a very active participant in open and free access to content. Um, we are also a deep supporter of the open culture community, including Open Glam and the Glam Wiki initiatives, which is the galleries, libraries, archives, and museums. So with all of these things considered, the DPLA is an ever-growing national network of libraries, archives, museums, cultural heritage institutions, and volunteers with a local impact in our communities strengthened by a global reach. There are many ways to get involved, <laughs> um, and we would love to have you get involved in the DPLA. Um, you can make sure and make, make and share a playlist of your favorite items in the collections, and I'll show you that in a little bit. It's a really fun thing to do. Um, you can also get on the forums and connect with other folks interested in the DPLA, and you can give us feedback through the discussion forums as well. You can attend events, and in fact, coming up in October, we have the DPLA Fest taking place in Boston, um, which is going to be a really amazing two-day experience. We'll have the, a large um, social event, um, kind of launch-like event on Thursday, and then on Friday, and I can give you guys the dates in a little bit if you're interested, um, we will be actually doing workshops and sessions and having a hackathon and some different things like that. So it's a two-day event in October. So also, if you like to code or if you know others that like to code in your community, um, encourage them to check out the API and see if there's a way that they can leverage it or use it for their own purposes. Also, uh, we would love it if you could support us through spreading the word about the portal, the platform, and its mission to expand our reach. Or if you want to get involved in more deeply, you can always email the team at info at dp.la, and I'll give you this again later so you don't have to hurry to write it down. You can always email us and let us know you want to become more involved, and we have plenty of committees you could be a part of or ways that you can contribute. And so lastly, if you're interested in contributing content, um, you can go to the Become a Partner section on our website, and you'll find information on how to determine whether your institution might be a service or content hub, as well as contact information um, for our staff that can help answer questions and provide guidance. So let's just shoot on over to the actual site and take a look. Uh, Jamie, we do have a question. Sure. Um, um, from the audience. Um, so as we're talking about the content that's in the DPLA, um, mm -hmm. the question is, so is all the content within the DPLA open access? Yes, everything. Okay. And it will remain yeah. that way. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's one of the requirements, I guess, being a part of it, is that it is yes. all that kind of information. Great. That's good to hear. Exactly. <laughs> and if you guys yep. have any other yes. questions. Yeah, yeah, and, and the, the, the question says, great, just checking. <laughs> um, yeah, and so if anyone does have any questions while we're um, doing this right now, yeah, feel free to type into the questions section of your GoToWebinar interface. Um, just as a reminder, you can do that at any time, and I'll catch it and pass the question on to Jamie. Or if you have a microphone, let us know, and we'll unmute you, and um, you can ask your question that way. Okay. So just, like, just not look anything came in just now, so go ahead and let's see the site. Okay. So I'll take you guys through, and um, I don't know if you've already been on the site and looked around a bunch. There's a lot there. So this was the new site that just launched in April. Um, we had a temporary site up before that, um, and this is a more robust, but it's being updated all the time. So we're adding more features and uh, more functionality all the time, um, every week. <laughs> so keep, a, keep an eye on it, and you'll see more things being added. So on the main thing that you can do here is just search the library. And you can see how many items we have under that where it says a wealth of knowledge. And there's that slider of photos. You can see how many items we currently have. And you can search straight from there. And we'll do that in just a minute. 
Um, you can also do the, take a look at the exhibits and explore by um, date and by place. You can see those. So let's go ahead and just go in and do a quick search. So anyone have a search term that they'd like to me to try or should I just throw something up there? Well, well, Any we could be we could be very um, um, obvious and sorry, like Nebraska. <laughs> I don't know if that might be too vague, but <laughs> you can tell I've already done that. <laughs> Let's pop it up, and I'll show you why I did that earlier. So um, we have four thousand five hundred seventy-five results that have oh. Nebraska in there. So on the right here, you can search by who owns it. Um, what the partner that provided that content was, um, the format. So we want to maybe just look at images. Let's say that. And you know you can take the date because if you know what date range you're looking for or language, or location, or subject. So let's look at um, photographs. And then if you wanted to go in and look at the content. So all of the information is pulled in here, but if you want to actually look at the object, that's where you would hit view object, and that's what takes you out to the partner. So that's from the Mountain West Digital Library, and so you get taken to their site. So you can also do that same search by map. Let's go to map, and let's see what happens if we search Nebraska and the map. So a lot of people other than Nebraska are talking about Nebraska <laughs> or have resources about Nebraska. Yeah, cool. <laughs> obviously, obviously you have the most, but mm. there's a mm. few things all over the place. Minnesota has quite a few. And then when you zoom in, so let's zoom in specifically to you guys' state. And it will break things up, and so you can kind of see where everything is distributed distributed. More regional, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, could so we also do like a combination, like, because someone did actually, while I was saying do Nebraska, um, someone actually typed in to do something on the Civil War, so you could do a combination of like Nebraska and Civil War and see what kind yeah. of things come up for that. Oops. It helps if you can type. <laughs> Let's do just Civil War and see if there's mm. anything. So you guys don't have anything. Hmm. <laughs> but that, I mean, you guys were not very active at that time. Possibly not. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that was just a separate suggestion was the Civil War <laughs> so let's, on its um, own, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, also, and it does use all the boolean operators and all that stuff too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the other usual. <laughs> yeah, um, the I do usual. have a question about searching. Someone else said they did a search in the Hathi Trust, and then in the um, the DPLA, but didn't get all of the Hathi Trust resources. Is all of it indexed through there, or do they pick and choose, or is that just a kind of a feature of how the searches work. Yeah, um, if you're searching of the, uh, one of these locations on their own site and then searching you guys, should it be the same results or maybe would something come up differently for some reason? For the most part, it's going to be the same. Mm. Um, they're our newest partner. <laughs> mm, okay. So it might just be that we're still working on some of their, their data and some of their information. Mm, might um, not all be loaded in there exactly. yet, available. That we, makes sense. We just uh, added them last month. Ah, okay. So they're Brand very new. new for us. Mm -hmm. But it should be pretty much everything. Mm -hmm. Once they're all in there, yeah. So um, this is the okay. timeline tool. Yeah, okay. I was looking at this. This looks very interesting. So it's, and you can look by year. It's a really cool resource. So then let's go ahead and go look at the exhibits real quick. And if there are other questions, just um, yeah, someone does have a question about the resources once you actually get out to one of them, and mm -hmm. um, 
I think I know the answer to this question because we do a similar thing here, but um, you can answer it. Um, some, they want to know, would we still need to get permission to use any of these resources? For example, if faculty wanted to use them in an assignment, I noticed copyright statements. Yeah, I, go ahead. You can mm -hmm. see. So here's that resource we looked at mm -hmm. earlier, and right. it'll tell you what the rights are and how you can use it. Right. And... Um, yeah, this one has a nice long copyright statement explaining what to do. And so I think it would be, it's going, once you're out of the DPLA, it's going to depend right. on each, um, partner what their rules are for it. And sometimes it goes, it's by, um, item, you know, depending on where they got yes. the item from, the object from, whoever, wherever that original owner is may have their own rights on it. So it's going to be on a case by case basis depending on what uh, object you're actually looking at. That's Absolutely. what my experience. Um, and even with, you know, I actually, <laughs> I used to work in, uh, in a publishing company and my job, one of my jobs was to acquire rights. Mm -hmm. And it's really interesting, a lot of libraries own the copyright on items in their collection. Mm, cool. Um, yeah. That's not an uncommon thing to mm -hmm. find at all. So let's look at one other thing. I'm pulling up all these things from the mountain. West Digital <laughs> Library, but um, so here's the another version of information. Right. So look in that rights field of each um, of the record for each one you go to and figure out how to you know go about doing it. And usually, sometimes it will lead you to who you can contact if you do need to get rights, or it will say it's you know freely usable. This particular one, do what you want yeah. with it. Just yeah. So they'll give send you to if you do need to do something official. And it depends on how it's going to be used as well, as we know, right. you know, faculty using it um, just in a class is different from someone wanting to put a, that, you know, include this photo in a book they're publishing. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. And you, there are going to be different rights for if you want it to show up online. Um, mm -hmm. in an, on a site like DeepLA, that's okay, but often, and you should talk with them about that, but in an advertisement, that's often not okay. So mm -hmm. it depends on your intent of the use. Right. Yep. If it doesn't list who to contact and the rights to just when you go to the source just reach out to them <laughs> yeah <laughs> they usually know what's up with what they put out there or they know who to send you to oh. yeah so let's look at the exhibits I think the exhibits are really cool um, I absolutely love the prohibition one <laughs> maybe it's because I'm obsessed with the resurgence of the cocktail culture but <laughs> <laughs> that isn't um, yes that is getting very popular yeah so this is an example of one of the exhibits, and then they have, it's almost like sections within the exhibits within them. Um, they're really great and interesting things, and, and they're a way to highlight, especially for, for libraries out there, I think they're a good way to highlight some of our contents as a nation. So you could throw mm -hmm. up a link to this and say, take, check out online exhibits on your site very easily. So then this would be taking from all the various collections across the country that you guys connect to and c putting them into these topic areas, into these exhibit yes. areas. Cool. So who does this? Do you guys have, do you guys have uh, librarians on staff that do this or archivists? or? <laughs> Most of this comes from um, either our partner organizations mm -hmm. or our um, fellows and interns. Ah, okay. You got people. So we have people that yeah. are working on this piece. <laughs> yeah. From both our partner organizations and from DPLA. Mm. So then let's take a quick look at the apps. This gives you mm. a view of all the apps. So these are, and there are six per page. Um, so if you want to go and become what, or see what's become of the API and what some people have created, um, this is a great way to go in and kind of see what's out there. Okay, and then I want to show you, see, it says, welcome Valentine Lulu, that's me, I'm mm -hmm. logged in. So when you hit, there's a login button when you're not logged in, and you can sign out, but when you are logged in, it has your information, and then you can save items and lists, and I made a Nebraska list <laughs> oh, cool. um, before nice. this. So it's just got <clears throat> some things that uh, came up and are associated with Nebraska, and of course, you guys have Warren Buffett. Yes, and Kool-Aid, <laughs> um, yes, uh, Kool-Aid was invented here, we're so proud. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there's some really interesting things, including, like, this is a, a video um, oh, cool. about Boys Town. Um, 
this is this prairie chicken, the greater prairie chicken. That's actually a an audio file of the sounds that they oh, make. Oh, neat. Um, so there's all sorts of different things you can use to create specific, um, collections specific to topics mm -hmm. you're um, hoping students will do or maybe exhibits or programming you're doing at the library and then you can save them. Mm -hmm. And then if you're, go ahead. So um, just noticing from looking at this that it's then the, the types of digital objects that are in here will vary. I mean, I, I know some um, digital libraries or collections online are specific to photographs or newspaper mm -hmm. articles or something, but this is just pretty much any format possible. If it's digital or online, it can be in here. Absolutely. Yep. We want, um, as Dan Cohen, our uh, executive director of DPLA says, we want the, the breadth of human expression. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. So we want it all. Um, um, Oh, so we do have a question about that. The the mm -hmm. what you've done there, the, the when you've made a list um, and saved, I, and obviously you're getting over. I know to save searches, but the list. So I want to know: Can you share a link to that list freely, like on a library's online subject guide? Yes, you can. So even though you use That's your account point. to create that, then that link. Um, and I see. Actually, you've got some that looks like there's a lock or an unlock next to them. There would that mm -hmm. be like the difference between making it public or not? Yeah. So you can add descriptions and then yep. decide whether it's private or not. Cool. And then if it's not private, it's freely shareable. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And then you can also, if you have a work in progress, <laughs> you can also mm -hmm. just do like, uh, you can have saved searches where you can come back. The other thing about this is if it's some a topic that you're regularly looking up or, you, or doing research on, mm -hmm. if you save that search and you come back later, you will, there, if, there are more con if there's been more content added to the site, it will show up here. Oh, cool. Okay, so, so it'll keep update. you up to date. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to like so rerun the search; it just kind of automatically keeps adding to your results. Right. Cool. So those are some cool, I think, some cool mm -hmm. tools. Yeah. Um, so then I also want to just give you a quick information. So if you're looking for more information about us, under the About page, there's some of the stuff that I've talked to you guys about today. Um, there's the FAQ information about our funding, um, our history, who are, what are our policies. So I know some of you guys have had some policy questions. Those are all mm -hmm. publicly available in there. Um, who we are, so this includes our staff, our board of directors, and all of the committees and partners. Um, and as you will see, we have a lot of people involved. These are all of our committees. So we've been really fortunate to get a diversity of organizations and individuals. Um, involved in this project. And this is where you can look at some of the digital hubs and some of the collaborators as well, is under partners. Cool. And the get involved, there is the information on becoming a partner that I mentioned earlier. If you if you or another organization that you work with, you, think you would like to get them involved with becoming a partner, um, this has information on how to become a service hub, how to become a content hub, what the differences are, all that sort of stuff. So that's all available there, and you can also ask questions, and I'll give you my contact info and DPLA as a whole's contact info at the end here. Mm -hmm. You can also check out under events. Um, this is where DPLA staff and board members and others are speaking in person. So if you guys want to find a way to connect with um, people in person, you can do that here. This is the DPLA Fest, so the 24th and 25th of October in Boston. And so that's our big annual event. And you can see more about that here. And that's going to be a really amazing thing. <laughs> I'm excited. I'll actually get to meet all of my other board members in person for the first time. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> um, you, haven't had chance, you haven't <laughs> had a chance to actually get to it. Well, you said you are, you are brand new, yeah, so... I am brand new, and I don't know if you guys heard the story. We launched officially in April. We had an in-person and two-day DPLA Fest. We had something like that happening in April. Unfortunately, it was at the Boston Public Library the same week as the Boston Marathon and the bombings there. Right. I remember that, yes, and that yeah. it was, then it, it was, you know, the site went live, but the actual um, in-person event was postponed. Right. Or, yeah. There were, Boston needed to focus on other things at that time. <laughs> um, but okay, here's the forums piece, and you can give feedback here, you can ask questions, um, talk with others on the site. 
this is especially helpful, as you can tell, that the tech community is the most active there. It's especially mm -hmm. helpful for the developers or if you're working with anyone that is using that piece. And then here's this direct link to the DPLA Fest. And then for the developers, here's the um, information on the API. And we do use GitHub. Um, so you can also check out our stuff on GitHub. Um, and you can do the bulk download. You can learn more about AppFest. You can see some of our sample code. Um, all that sort of stuff is available under the developers piece. Um, just for, for anyone that's not um, aware, can you give a little um, explanation of the API and what that is and how, what, you know, like you said earlier, in case some people aren't, um, don't know what that is and how they can use that and what's that's, what that's all about, doing API? Yeah, okay. So an API is um, it's a collection of code. So it's protocols, routines, um, and just code that um, builds software applications. And it, the, an API is a software-to-software -software interface. So it's basically code that allows um, the two pieces of code or the two pieces of software to talk to each other. Um, so with uh, APIs, applications talk to each other without any user knowledge or intervention. So a good API makes it easier for a developer to create an application that makes use of a particular set or sets of data by providing all that built the information, all the metadata, the building blocks needed to integrate that data set into his or her application software design. Um, so for a software company, for instance, will release its API to the public so that other developers can design products that work with that software. Um, and I know that, I don't know if that helps um, put that in context, but it's kind of, it just helps the tech talk to each other, mm -hmm, basically. Right. Just something that makes it a little easier if you want to have something like on your own website or something. Like the ones that you have on the API list there are, some, are actually good examples, I think, that show this is mm -hmm. what it can do. And by releasing it and making it open, I, you hear a lot of companies that do that. Um, and sometimes there's issues with them and <laughs> what they do and don't allow. <laughs> yeah. But it, it just gives you one step closer. And then if you have someone who is able to do some coding on your side or something you can get on board to do that, that you can, you know, get that connection a little better, yeah. Right. And that's like one other example. Um, so I'm also doing work with digitallearn.org. That's one of my mm -hmm. projects. And we have uh, on the bottom of our homepage a map that says if you want in-person help, put in your zip code. Well, we have that powered by the Everyone On campaign. And it's using their open API about their collection of where you can get in-person help. And we just tap into that. So when they update their information, our site's automatically updated. So it's kind of how that works. Cool. So here's the um, some of the more tech stuff under the developer stuff. Um, and then also, if you wanted to stay abreast of what's happening and keep uh, in the loop with DPLA, the, uh, the blog, our press area, um, all of that sort of stuff is a great place to do it. Also, we would love it if you would follow us on Twitter. Um, or like us on Facebook or any of those types of things and just kind of get involved and keep abreast of what's happening because we have tons of news coming out all the time. Um, and as you can tell here, we have lots of updates that have, have come out. See, uh, here's, it was just about a month ago that we um, added Haiti Trust. So that's all in there. And then last but definitely not least is you can contact us through this contact form. You're always welcome to do that. We are um, here for you. We're definitely for the community, by the community. So um, any feedback, ideas, questions, just help us make the DPLA better. And then lastly, here is DPLA contact info and my contact info in case you want to reach out to me about any of this. I'm also available to help. And again, I'm kind of the new kid, so I don't necessarily have all the answers, but I'm I will find them if I can't get them, if I don't know them <laughs> off the top of my head. That's what librarians do. Exactly. <laughs> That's what we're all about. I don't have a clue, but I can find out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I have, I have the emails of the people with the answers, so. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's the important part, yes. Um, okay, does anybody have any other questions um, for Jamie? Anything else you want to ask her about the Digital Public Library of America, what they're doing, what's in there? Um, anything else, any other searches or anything you want her to show on the website that she um, didn't go into or anything you want to see um, more in depth? 
Let's see, I'm looking at it here. Hmm. Doesn't look like anybody's typing anything in. Anything else you want to show us on there that on the website? I know you went through our a bunch of your stuff already there. Um, I think I think we're pretty good. <laughs> cool. Um, I know that's a lot of yeah. info. It's a big yeah. project. <laughs> well, it's a big project, and yeah, that's what I think. Um, there's so much in there. I think this is a. a one of the pros and cons, I guess, of these digital libraries and everything. There's just so much um, in there yeah. to explore, and uh, you can just get lost in it, <laughs> uh, which is a good thing uh, in some cases. Um, but I think it's good to see that the, how things, the searching is available, and especially those exhibitions where you've pulled out certain things. And I assume that that's the kind of thing you said will be added to as new topics mm -hmm. come up, up or whatnot. So there'll be new things in there to see all the time. Um, Absolutely. Things that are, you know, current events that might be related or something. Uh, the the uh, the hundredth anniversary of something that happened. Um, yes. So, and be you know, I on the day in April when we fully launched the site, a bunch of us um, got in and just started looking for things that were meaningful to us, and then mm -hmm. we shared those out on Twitter. And if you guys have an interest in um, sharing those stories on Facebook or Twitter, if you get in there and you find something that's really amazing to you, um, please let us know because those are the stories that. It, help us to communicate the value of this, as you guys know, with communicating the value of libraries. Mm -hmm. um, but that's a really powerful um, way to show the impact of access is just by personal stories. So if you get in there mm -hmm. and you find something great, let us know. Mm -hmm. And I'll share my story actually from um, our launch day. I am actually, my family, I shouldn't say me, is actually originally from Louisiana. I'm Cajun. Oh, cool. <laughs> through and, through. and um I come from a part of the state that doesn't often have a lot going on. Um <laughs> my dad's graduating high school class was I think eleven people. Wow. So mm -hmm. small. And I so the day um that this launched, I got in there and started looking around and I found let me see if I can get in there. If it's gonna show me. Now it's not gonna work. All four objects. Oops. Um, and I was able to find photos of a town that my family is from. Oh. And hadn't I, I didn't think that they would be able to find it. Now let me see if I can find it. I might have to do a search. Well now it's not showing up. Now that I'm going to show you guys. Hmm. It says it has nine has nine results, so Yeah. <clears throat> well, let's go in. I'll just do a regular search. And this is going to be sound like a weird search. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it got yeah. removed. So this is the town my family's from. It's Malmo, mm -hmm. Louisiana. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that photo's not in mm -hmm. there anymore. Oh, so I'll have to find that. <laughs> See, things but, can change all the time, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they can. So, anyway, but if you guys have those um, stories, please share them. Uh, it's not awesome to find the first result is about hazardous industrial waste. <laughs> but, uh, you're going to find a lot of environmental stuff in here, too. I do want to mention mm -hmm. that. We have, because we have the, um, the archives, they have so much for the Environmental Protection Agency. Mm -hmm. You'll find all sorts of historical environmental info about your community if, if anyone needs that. Yeah, and that's something you definitely, going back to this historical information, because you, you can find a lot of current stuff, but if you want to know, was there stuff here 20, 30, yes. 40 years ago? I need to know that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. Great. Okay. Maybe All right. Doesn't look like yeah anything. Nobody typed in any urgent questions while we were chatting. Just um, thanks for the presentation and uh, comment. The DPLA is an amazing resource. I can't wait to explore it. Mm -hmm. Oh, great. So, Thanks yeah. So much. Me too. I've been jumping in and out of it when I have time to and just, like I said, getting a little lost and looking at things. Um, it's great. It can totally be a time sink, <laughs> <laughs> which is when you know you found a good resource. Mm -hmm. <laughs> all right. So, all right, then I think that we'll, then we'll wrap it up since nobody has any questions at the moment. Um, you can, of course, explore the site and contact Jamie and she can um, answer any of the questions you have after um, 
backwards. So um, let's see here. I'm going to pull back control then. Thank you very much, Jamie. This was like a very fun, very uh, good information to get us started. Uh, Hopefully, more organizations will get involved in it as well. I know, I know, it's, yeah. I know there's lots of other um, groups out there doing digital libraries or digital collections. Um, and I know you start out with the big guys, which makes sense, get stuff in there. But I'm hoping that some other maybe smaller, and that's something you'd have too, like if there's a smaller, more local, like historical society mm -hmm. or something, that that would be something, a group that could uh, join. Absolutely. And I will mention, just in closing, we, we are very much interested in making sure that rural and small libraries are part of this too. Mm -hmm. Right. As you said, we, we started with the big guys to get a lot of content fast for our launch, but we are really committed to making sure that um, rural and small collections are an important piece of this and are included. Um, and we're thinking of a lot of different ideas. We're brainstorming on what that looks like. Um, I don't even know if we'll be able to do it. We've even talked about creating a, a, um, a Scannabago is um, what one of the staff members of DPLA came up with, and we would travel around. Oh, in, okay, uh, yeah. In a per special Winnebago specifically to mm. scan and digitize local collections. A, a, a so. traveling scanning station or scanning lab. Oh, cool, yeah. So that's a dream for one day. So we are, we are very interested in rural and small collections mm -hmm. and communities, and, and um, that's something we're definitely talking about. So if you have thoughts and ideas on that, please let me know. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. the lab area and interest area for me specifically, so mm -hmm. I'm your contact on that one probably. Right. Yeah, no, we, we have here um, Nebraska Memories is the local, is the Nebraska Library Commission's uh, digital library of, of think, collections that we have. Um, we're mainly doing um, photographs and postcards and things like that, but we also have a scanner that will take out to places if a library doesn't have their own um, equipment, right. but they've got the, inf got the you know, objects, the pictures. Um, we we'll do, we'll do things for that for libraries sometimes too. That's great. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> yeah. All right. Cool. All right. Thank you very much then. Um, so I think we will, as I said, we'll wrap it up for today. No new, no new questions have come in. So we are good. Um, so I'll say thank you, Jamie. Thank you, everyone, for attending this morning. Um, the session has been recorded, of course. So we'll have the recording up so you'll be able to go back and watch it later. Um, so that will wrap it up for this morning's Encompass Live. I hope you join us next week when it will be our regular monthly Tech Talk with Michael Sowers, who is the Technology Innovation Librarian here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Next week he has something maybe a little different than some of the normal tech talks. Uh, a little techy on one part and maybe not so much on the other. <laughs> um, two librarians from libraries here in Nebraska. Lindsay Thompson who is at La Vista Public Library and Gordon Wyant is at Bellevue Public Library. And they're both doing some very interesting um, young adult events. Um, the main uh, um, part of this that got Michael interested was at Bellevue, Gordon has set up a Minecraft server. If anyone's interested in the Minecraft game, you can go and check that, look that up. <laughs> um, their own library hosted one for the teens to come in and use, so that was really the tech part of this. Um, but we're also going to share what Lindsay is doing at La Vista with a life-sized in-person um, Arkham Horror program. So um, join us next week to see what the heck that is all about and what you can do maybe at your library. So other than that, we are wrapped up for this morning. Thank you very much for attending. And oh, wait, Next, Encompass Live is also on Facebook. I almost forgot. <laughs> so um, if you are a big Facebook user, please do uh, go ahead and like us there. Um, we post all of our shows to here when a new one's coming up, when the recordings are available. I also post a reminder, as I did this morning, join us right now for, uh, you know, we're starting in just 10 minutes. So you can pop in and uh, join the show. So if you are um, on Facebook, go ahead and like us there, and you get notified of what we're doing there. So other than that, thank you very much, and we'll see you next week on Encompass Live. Bye-bye.